Welcome to the seminar on just mobility transitions. I'm Sitar Sarin, I'm a researcher at the Center for Climate and Energy Transitions and, and, and Transformation, and uh, very pleased to be back in Bergen Life, so I recently moved to a position at the University of Stavanger. Um And today we are going to talk about the link between justice and mobility, but not only mobility in terms of getting around the city, but also mobility that's changing. Um, so, transitioning in many ways. And for that, we have a lineup of speakers. I will introduce them in turn, but uh, we will start with four speakers now. Have questions for a few minutes while you can get a coffee refill. We need to not have mass movement in the room. So, uh, a couple of rules logistically that are important to remember are uh, to keep your distance, of course, to take a photo of the number of the chair you're sitting on. They're all numbered so that later, if there is an incident in the room, um, we can let you know. You've registered your uh, contact details with us outside. If you haven't, please make sure you do that later as well. And, um, and after the 15 minute break, when you can take up coffee, but keep sitting and asking questions as well, we will have a half hour panel um, where we talk a little bit about a project that we have going on where we're studying this uh, at the University of Bergen, and then another half hour where we have a panel discussion. So. I will uh, hand over to uh, our first speaker, who is Professor Howard Harshka, who is Director of the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation. Thanks, Sid. And uh, it's so great to be physically present in the room. Uh, I talk, talk to someone. <laughs> I was looking for my mute button, uh, un unmute button, but uh, old habit from, from Zoom that we're now used to. So what I would, uh, would like to do to start off this, um, uh, this seminar is to contextualize a little bit. So we will hear um, different talks about what's going on in Bergen and some of the research that, that um, is taking place. Um, but I would like to sort of take a step back and, and, um, and, and begin the day by, by, by putting um, a, a broader perspective on, on mobility and, and justice and what do these things have to do uh, with, with one another. To, start, to get you to start thinking about what are the relationships between between these, these concepts. What does mobility and transport have to do with, uh, with justice uh, and, and, and social, uh, social issues? So, I, for me, this is a, one of my favorite photographs. And I think, to me, this really illustrates uh, many things. Uh, but it also illustrates uh, how transport, uh, mobility, and the access to those things uh, is, is socially divided. So this is a picture uh, taken uh, by a, a, a very famous photographer, Margaret Burke White. It's from uh, the United States, from, um, uh, taken during the, the uh, Depression era, I think this is 1929. And to me, it really sort of puts into uh, contrast this idea of, of the American dream and how um, uh, the um, this idea that that, uh, that, that uh, this core family uh, with car ownership, private uh, private mobility, uh, has been uh, ha has been talked about. I mean, what you see here, uh, of course, is a an advertisement on, on the wall, and underneath the wall is a bread bread queue. People lining in in uh, in, uh, in uh, lining up to to get food food relief during the. The, uh, the depression. So it shows some of the, the social um, social divisions that exist. Of course, in this case, they're very um, racial, right? Uh, but there are other types of divisions uh, as well around transport and, and transport mobility that, that are, are, are interlinked. And in in, ter in uh, the uh, American context, we, we very often talk about the growth of, of suburbs and the urban development after the Second World War as, as, as white flight, as, as white people moving out of the city centers uh, and then the city centers becoming uh, more uh, slum, slum based. So we've seen urban development like this and this is a, a, a very sort of predominant way of thinking about uh, mobility and transport in the, in the years after the Second World War where uh, the, the logic was, was, was efficiency, getting people to, from, from point A to point B uh, as fast as possible. We had planners and politicians, uh, and also academics had this vision that uh, car traffic uh, and private mobility 
uh, are the, uh, the, the, uh, the best, the most efficient ways of, of getting people around. So um, we like to point, point to the United States, but of course we had a very similar development uh, here in Norway and, and most, uh, mo most places in the world. Then for the past decades, maybe from the 1980s and 1990s, we've had a much a stronger shift uh, and a different way of thinking about uh, mobility and transport that has kind of slowly but gradually and very strongly um, uh, influenced uh, our, our way of thinking. And I think, th so this, this pyramid uh, is an illustration of, of this, of, of the kind of the way I think we've, we've tried to begin to think about mobility for the past decades. Um, and this particular pyramid, uh, it's called the reverse transport pyramid, exists in many different versions, many different forms. Some of you may have, ha have seen different versions of this. But the idea is that um, at the top of, of, of the pyramid, the most important, the central element uh, of the transport systems should be people and people-centered uh, mobility. And building sort of further down from that, um, you have uh, other types of, sort of, of, of um, mechanized and, and, and uh, for forms of transport that are, are still are going from the most kind of human-centered, uh, human-driven on, on the top to the most kind of technologically uh, infrastructure-needing uh, modalities at the bottom. So the idea then being that we should generate a transport system that has... Um, where you fly only in the cases where you absolutely need to. That's kind of the minimum. Uh, we try to minimize uh, flying, to minimize private car traffic. And then you solve those kinds of, of transport needs uh, further up, uh, as much as you can further up in the, in the, in the hierarchy. So when we talk about this in the university and teach about this in the courses in, in human geography and, um, and the, teach the courses that, that I've been part of teaching, we very, very often we talk about the sustainable mobility paradigm. And this is a very, very famous um, article ri written by um, a, a transport uh, professor at the University of Oxford, David Bannister, who, and I think it, it really captures the, this shift from, uh, let's say, the image that I showed with all the, the large interstates, uh, big highways, towards more human-centric uh, uh, mobility. And I would say, um, sort of on the, from you at the right side of the, col of the column is where, at least when we talk about city development today, and if you ask planners what they think is good urban development, it's very much on, on, on the right side, on what, what's here called the alternative approach. And that's um, um, looking at, I, th I think maybe the third line from the top is perhaps the most important, focus on traffic, to, uh, from a fo focus on traffic to um, a focus on people. Um, you sh a shift in scale from thinking of large scale transport systems to more and more thinking about the local scale um, to thinking about the street as not just a road, as not just somewhere you can place the car, uh, but as a space that different types of, of, uh, of, uh, of um, transport and mobility can take place. So, the idea here, and then the connection to justice, I think, is that within the, um, the alternative approach, it's much more uh, focused on, on the accessibility of different types of, of transport, uh, tra transport users. So a lot of the complaint, of course, about this, what's here called the, the conventional paradigm, I would call it the car-based paradigm, would be that it, um, it prioritizes those who can afford their own car. And it, and, um, uh, and it's, um, it's less advantageous for, for those who um, don't have their own car or don't, don't, don't want to have their own car, uh, prefer, prefer uh, or need other types of, of, uh, of, of transportation. It's much more of a, a, a variety of different transport options that we're now trying to, trying to, uh, to, uh, to stimulate. And this so, so I would say, again, if you, if you look at the, the, the urban planning philosophies uh, in Norwegian cities, European cities, cities across the world the past couple of decades, this has been very, very strong, I would say. And also quite heavily uh, pushed in 
uh, different types of policy uh, mechanisms. So in, in Norway, we have um, uh, Nullex Morland, which uh, we might translate into the zero growth objective. And that states that all growth in personal traffic should be taken not by personal uh, or private cars, but by walking, cycling, and public transportation. So, um, in one uh, recent publication, we looked at, um, at, at how this uh, Nublex Moreland had this goal that, that all growth in, in personal traffic should be taken by going, uh, walking, cycling, and, and uh, public transportation, has sort of kind of grown uh, in, in significance in Norwegian uh, policy. We look found, first time we found this goal mentioned was uh, 2006. Uh, in uh, a white paper, and then I'm not, I'm not going to go into the details here, but, but to kind of trace how, how this has been become more and more important, um, and it's used in uh, the national transport plans, the, the national transport plan in 2014, mentioned the zero growth target 23 times, uh, the 2018 national transport plan mentioned it eight, 51 times, we have this uh, BVEX data, this, this funding schemes for cities where the, you now actually measure, uh, actually fund cities um, after how well they, uh, they have policies to meet the zero growth objective. So, so basically, my point is, there's a very strong um, policy, policy push and political agreement, I would say, uh, about this kind of uh, transport, transport paradigm. Look to Bergen. Uh, this is the, the, the platform of the current city government. And the first sentence uh, is about uh, that uh, Bergen should be a good, a fair, and inclusive city where it's good to live, uh, etc. So even that, that just this uh, aspect comes in, comes, in strongly, uh, comes, in, comes in strongly there. But the question then, and I think this is what we will talk about today at, the, at this seminar, is, okay, so we have this... this quite widespread agreement that we need uh, sustainable mobility for climate reasons, for justice reasons, uh, urban development reasons, and other reasons. So how do we uh, achieve it? Like we, when we look around, um, there's still uh, big roads, still a lot of car traffic, private car traffic. Um, that infrastructure is in place. How, how do we achieve it? And how do we deal with these new technologies and new opportunities that, that come? Digitalization, um, shared platforms, and that's my cue to stop talking. Um, uh, you know, this culture of sharing that, that, that is growing. Um, and uh, electric mobility. So we have a lot of different challenges in trying to implement these sorts of uh, policies and these sorts of ideas today. And that's what um, speakers in, in this uh, seminar will, um, will, will talk about. And. Um, this is something that we uh, were quite interested in uh, and working on in terms of research. And we, um, we have various research projects that are, are looking into this. Um, and uh, for, this, uh, for, the coming, for, for this seminar and for the coming uh, two, three years, I think, we, we, um, we pulled together this, these different uh, strands of our research and work into what we call uh, the Just Mobility Transitions Research Program. Um, and Siddharth here, uh, his, um, his kind of the, the leading intellectual, the brain behind this, I think. Uh, unfortunately, he recently moved to Stavanger, but we have a very close uh, contact with him still. So um, I'll leave it there and uh, let you introduce the, the next uh, speaker. Looking forward to the seminar. Entanglements that geographers <laughs> talk about. <laughs> <laughs> um, it, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Lars Ulrich Kvalbein uh, as our next speaker. He's an advisor at uh, Bergen Kommune. He is in. Uh, he's associated with Bumilio uh, Etaten, which I suppose uh, would translate to the Urban Environment Agency. Um, and uh, I'll leave the floor to you. And switch. Nice, thank you. 
Thank you so much for the invitation, and uh, thank you, Paul, for this nice framing. I hope I'll put some um, um, concrete examples that you can relate to this framework uh, that you're lining up. Um, planning mobility transitions is the headline. Um, it's about planning, but it's also about experimentation and piloting and trying new things out, I think. Um, we have, as a foundation for this work, um, the most important thing uh, for us, of course, are the policy documents. And as you can see, in Bergen, it's always very nice weather. <laughs> so um, we get some issues around air quality. <coughs> At least we had some issues some years ago that lead, led the politicians and the city to pass a very ambitious document, the Green Strategy, which lines out the path to a completely fossil-free uh, 2030. And that year is approaching very fast. Um, and I think many of us haven't really realized how ambitious this is, how much this demands of us. But we have tried to sort of break this down into um, some more tangible goals on this, on the on sort of timeline also in this green strategy um, to get uh, to that goal in 2030. Uh, and the new city government that Ova referred to has uh, turned uh, turned up heat even more, or to, turned down. We're talking about turning down the heat, actually. But um, they've made even more ambitious targets than this figure shows. Um, and it, it might be a bit nerdy these numbers you see. Uh, you know, 1.3 persons per car in rush hours. Currently is 1.15, but going from, from 1.15 persons in each car up to 1.3 means putting the equal number of everyone that uses public transport today into empty seats in cars. So it's a quite big feat, and I don't think we'll manage uh, that soon. <laughs> um, and also to reduce co private car ownership from 1.35 average down to 1 means that 45,000 house, 45, households needs to get rid of at least one car. And that's for the next four or five years. So we have some, something to work on. Um, and also ambitious goals for the for uh, bicycle. Uh, this is the old strategy. The new strategy is now being um, politically processed these days. And underlining all this, zero growth target, uh, like Holger was talking about. Just to, to boil this down to four main uh, strategies, how to get to this uh, big target. Um, number one, it all starts with land use, spatial planning. That's where the foundation is laid. Um, but that takes time. So in the meantime, we need to do something more as well. And point two and three here is about the same thing. It's about model shift. Away, away from solo driving and private car into other more sustainable modes. And uh, we will single out shared mobility, especially in this uh, strategy. And I'll come back to why. We're, we were doing that. And then there's a number four, which usually get all the attention, at least in the international context, um, about all the electric cars that we do so well here in Norway. Um, spatial planning, uh, I won't say very much about that, but this is from the new master plan, aero plan passed last year for Bergen. Uh, it's quite strict to concentrate, uh, to uh, concentrate development around these hubs. Uh, but of course, the most powerful city planners in Bergen are the mountains. <laughs> and uh, the map is, uh, says it all when it comes to that. And 
And, um, and so when it comes to, to the modes, to the transport modes, this is our version, <laughs> now you see in a more detailed version already. This is a bit more simplified. This is uh, really uh, the, the essence of the guideline for what we're trying to do, planning. Um, of course, you, you can't get enough for walking and cycling. No problem. Just take as much as you can. Solve as much as you can with those modes. And then we need some motorized transport, and then we have the public transport to do most of that. And we need some deliveries, we need some goods to reach customers to make the city work. Um, but also on that level we have the, the shared modes. That's car sharing, ride sharing, and all those. That's a big universe in itself. And at the bottom we, we put the solo driver. It should be in a, in a big SUV, I think, but no. anyway. Uh, but why is this shared mobility so important? Why do we put so much emphasis on that when it's the top that matters? And that's because we believe that, that a change relation to your private car, that's the trigger point. That's where everything starts. That's where you uh, start considering more of the other modes as well. And uh, it's not just uh, something I say. It's a solid research from years of car sharing in Europe, station-based car sharing. Uh, uses of that, they, they do walk, cycle, and use much more public transport than others. And it's, it's quite logical. You get a help to get rid of those uh, silly car trips. 60% of all car trips are under 5 kilometers. You can do that in other ways, right? If you have that threshold, you have to book a car when you need a car. You, you get rid of those unnecessary trips. Okay, and um, when it comes to emissions, this is all, uh, so much about also about climate emissions and reducing them from the direct sources. And, and road transport is the biggest one by far. We got some uh, encouragement last year when this came, um, when we saw a very clear decline in climate emissions for Bergen and especially for transport. But then we, we got some less discouraging figures. Uh, for 2019, it went, I think, up a little bit again. But we hope that will be temporarily. And the, the main reason, main driver for that, um, is this. We, uh, we are, at, uh, I think there's no, no other city in the world beating us on this. Absolutely no other. No other Norwegian city, no other in the world. Um, this is from last month. Uh, now we, 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 we have the same, about even better figures than the record month uh, last year when Tesla delivered all their Model 3s at once. <laughs> uh, and in this internal combustion engine part, that consists of both hybrid diesel and petrol. And diesel and petrol together now consist of only 10% of sales, new car sales. So this is, this is encouraging, this works. Electrification works. Uh, I think more than 25% of the traffic now is electric and more than 20% of the car fleet in total. And that's, that's a world record. And the main reason for that, that's really important to remember, especially in the international uh, setting uh, where we, people think of electrification as subsidies. But for Norway, it's very important to say that what's important is what's going on on that side. That we're tax, taxing the fossil fuel cars. And we've built up the taxing of those cars over the years that no, no one else can match. And that's why this side gets so efficient. But also, of course, covering um, we're Many cities have different kind of towing schemes, but I think the Bergen one is one of the most comp comprehensive ones. And people from other countries in Europe, they, they um, when they see these numbers and this cost, they, they're really amazed. 
And it's really started working uh, in the right direction when we got the congestion charge in 2016, I think it was. Yeah, you see the drop. <laughs> um, so it started going in the right direction. But of course, not without friction, not without protests, as we see. All this, you know all about this. Uh, and we saw it in the last election. Inner city, 40% Green Party. <laughs> in Osana, huge, yeah. 40% uh, these guys. Protesters. So there's a big. Um, resistance here as well, and, and that needs to be taken into account. And then one more thing that's very important when it comes to policy planning and changing modes is parking. And that's something that the municipality is in charge of, that we've set an uh, area where we can do something. Um, this is from my neighborhood, built in the 50s, Londos, same. Same in, in uh, Lovestock Sieden or any other places in, in Bergen. It was built, planned with one car per 10 household as a guideline. And now the streets are cluttered with cars. So, <coughs> could we get back to one car but, um, for the 10 households? That's the question. Um, that was in the 50s before the free sales. Uh, we have a very, we are very fortunate. We are very fortunate in Bergen in having an in instrument that many other cities don't have, and that is the uh, residential parking screen, Bundesume, um, And um, that also makes it possible to do a principal decision about actually ending street parking. It will take some time, but the principal, principal decision has been made. There should be just a few exceptions to, to that. And of course, all new areas are planned with, without street parking. And uh, one way, uh, well, and then the, it's the established areas that are the big challenge here. But this uh, residential parking scheme can make it possible. This is an example from Skansen, the area. It was actually cleared of street parking to get the fire trucks through, mostly, but it resulted in, uh, in a very nice, more livable area, uh, an underground parking facility. They thought they had to build equally many spaces for parking in that facility as there were in the streets, but now it, it's not, it's not high, that high demand anymore. There are empty spaces there. And they could build this ice rink on top. Um, so this scheme, you know it, um, and our European colleagues, they envy us this instrument, and it works. Um, this is figures from, from uh, street parking permit sold, and uh, the increase in the uh, purple uh, column bit there is just because the scheme has been expanded to new zones. You see it from the red, it's a steady decline the number of cars. But when you do all these sort of strict measures, what can you do to give people an alternative? And that's what we are trying to figure out. And we've gotten some inspiration from Europe. From, this is from Bremen, Germany. I've been collaborating with them and other partners in some years in this interact project called Chernoff. And this is how our Belgian uh, friends uh, envisage this concept called um, the mobility hub. They call it movie print. Uh, movie hubs, they call it in, in, uh, in the UK now. And this, this idea and this concept is spreading uh, through this network and all over Europe. Um, and we were one of the first to, to start doing um, something on this. And just to show you Bremen has been doing uh, research, or not, or, well, at least reports on this um, regularly. And uh, their scheme, when it comes to the station-based car sharing, not the free-floating one, 
shows that each shared car replaces 16 private cars. So it's a powerful instrument to create more space for other things, other purposes in the city. Okay, our Mobi, Mobi hubs or mobility hubs, they, the core of it is that these reserved, clearly signed, marked places for shared cars. And in our case, we provide um, charging for them as well, so they can have, be electric as well, both electric and shared. Then we have charging facilities for private electric cars. There are some of those as well. And they need some street level charging, even though we try to prioritize charging in the indoor facilities. Um, bicycle parking, different kinds of it. Bicycle hangars, we've been testing in Memphis area, but now rolling out in larger scale. Normal bicycle racks connected up to our bike sharing scheme. And also try to enhance them with other kinds of improvements from in the city. And it's been very well received as far as we have come on. The first one opened in 2018, uh, so it's not it's not been that long. So the first six, seven months are have been in operation for a little bit of time. And we're now, for this year, next year, first half of next year, we'll be building about eight new ones. And they are more like, I'll show you, more like going from this pilot exploratory phase where we try out the concept and to, and to something that's more connected to other things going on in the city. So this is an example from the new ones. Uh, Sunday School Grand, that's an area that really needs it. Um, where we also upgrade the green environment, make a, a little park parklet uh, connected to the mobility hub as well. And near uh, Brown Stadion, Men Football Stadium, we also do upgrades for pedestrians and cyclists, uh, and so uh, those things at the same time. Um, and we always put in trees, <laughs> just trees, uh, more and more. But we need to um, not just be in the urban residential area. We need to think, what would, would this look like in, in the suburban setting? Um, so that's the next phase that we go into. And to guide us, we are um, trying to, in collaboration with the National Road Authority and the county of the transport company, in the project called MUST, uh, we're trying to more like be data driven in that planning in the various ways. I, I don't have time to go into details here, but it's about you know making, trying to pinpoint, to put together the right menu of services that's right for that area. Because the mobility hub is an open concept with a menu you can, you tailor it for all, for each place. So what would it look like in Oslo? We're trying to set up also as a living lab for many mobility pilots uh, now in the years to come. And the first one, maybe you've heard of, that's about uh, e-scooters. Now that's, uh, uh, we're rushing out to, to, um, to test out a digital regulation scheme, a new kind of tool for those e-scooters. And, and the aim is to try to see, can these in much, larger degree uh, contribute to the city goals. Not just be a toy for people in the city, but to do something to make people in Austin <coughs> reach their public transport or other uh, destinations easier. I know I'm a bit, uh, a few minutes over time, but I think I'll catch it up in the, in the, in the next <laughs> round, is, if that's okay, because there's one Really big important <coughs> point that I'll make uh, here at the end. That uh, uh, one thing is that um, governing documents and steering things that we, we 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 work according to. The other one is when looking into the future, what do we see? And, and there's a debate about digitalization afterwards that is really interesting. And um, there are different scenarios. We heard, heard a lot about self-driving cars. What would that do? To the city, what will it do to the transport systems? And the car manufacturers, they they, they would essentially like it 
the private car ownership to continue. So that, okay, it doesn't matter if you're stuck in traffic, you can just watch TV, relax, eat, and so on in the car. But <laughs> if you do that, there will be more traffic than today, and the whole city will be a big traffic jam. So our goal is to see what, what's the potential of this if you do it right, if you can govern this in the right way. Then it could be lead to, to um, much more space in the city for other things than cars. And the main um, report that we build that on, there's been many other reports as, as well, is this one. If there's one report you should read about the future of mobility, it's this one, <laughs> I would say. Because it explores the potential of a shared mobility system. Um, in this case, it, Lisbon, with actual transport data, is the case. They have a system of, of, of shared six seats taxis, minibuses, and a high capacity public transport uh, at the backbone. How many cars do you need then? How many vehicles do you need to give everybody all the transport they need at half the price of today? Well, you need 3% of that today's car fleet to solve all the mobility needs of, of the city. And even when it comes to self-driving vehicles, even more inclusive, more groups can, can have access to this system. And that means take away all street parking, yes, no brand new, take away 80% of all off-street parking, it's billions of property value for the city or for the property developers, I mean, just waiting to be used if you can do this right. And of course, reduced emissions, better accessibility and so on. So, how will that look like in Bergen? 3% of today's car fleet. Well, then you could fit all vehicles you need for the transport system of Bergen into Bigelarsen, Kostgelarsen, and a couple of more of uh, parking facilities. Of course, you won't do that, you will spread them out, but that, that gives you an idea. So, transport system of the future needs to be number one, again, walkable, cyclable, of course, electric, no, no, no emissions, and it needs to be shared. And then, okay, automated, yes, but only if if it makes sharing easier, if it reduces tra traffic accidents, supports walking and cycling, that's a big issue, and also makes the transport more inclusive. So, I hope Tony Seba will have right in his predictions. Thank you. Thank you, Jacob. You can hold on to that one for now, since uh, we'll be having you back for a discussion. This is the part where we see if, um, if things work as we would like them to work, because our next speaker is uh, coming in to us from Oslo today. Let's see if we can get her on here. All right. Yeah. Turi, are you with us? We can't see yeah. you yet, and Wilfried as well. So why don't I introduce you both and welcome you into the room. You can't see us, you can only see me um, but, uh, and each other, but we have uh, several dozen interested participants who just heard a uh, vision from, uh, from the Center for Climate and Energy Transformation and from Bergen Kommune on the future of um, urban mobility and transitions in Bergen. and uh, and. It's um, perfect to hand over to you, Tori. Now, Tori Langas is the Dowdly leader, the CEO of Bildelringen, which is uh, the biggest uh, car sharing operator in Bergen. And, um, and Lars Schlomo has um, sort of eased our way into your talk now, because he has just been talking to us about, uh, about car sharing and experiences in many cities. So over to you. Yeah. First, I would like to thank you for the invitation to have a presentation and to talk about car sharing, as I just solution. And uh, I will start with a short presentation of Bildelleringen, uh, which is maybe known to a lot of you already, but uh, still there are surprisingly some people not knowing about us. So, 
Wiedelinien was established in Bergen in 1996. And it was uh, 10 friends that got together and bought two cars to share between them. And uh, since then we have been growing each year and uh, today we have 263 vehicles and 2,750 members, 4,500 registered users. And we are organized as a cooperative and owned by members. And in 2019, we had a turnover on 33 million Norwegian kroner. Since we were established in 1990, we have had an annual growth 10 to 15 percent. But during the last three months, due to the COVID-19 situation, we have had a growth of almost nearly 50 percent which is quite a big change. So, for us, like the COVID-19 situation might be a tool. And during the last decade, there has been a growth toward looking at mobility as a service. Uh, and uh, instead of having private car open, and uh, there might be a few reasons to this change. Hopefully, uh, a growing awareness of the climate situation and global warming is uh, part of uh, this growth. But it's, I think, uh, the development of technology and new business models is a big uh, factor in explanation this shift as well. And for the situation of car sharing, uh, there are two main business models. We have station-based car sharing as speed delivery where you pick up and leave uh, the car at the same parking lot and you have got thing where you can pick up a car and deliver it on another place. It's more like city car. And the situation of the uh, station-based car sharing has been that there has been a steady and low growth, and the really big uh, growth has been on um, green floating car sharing. Uh, but it's only the station based car sharing that has proven to replace private car ownership. The green floating model. Uh, uh, it's very often replacing public transport and uh, trips with bicycles. So, uh, thinking of it in a green term, it's maybe not an improvement, but it could be an improvement for people to if they get around in cities, a convenient. And I have also been up to say some words about how the municipality of Bergen can contribute towards mobility as a system. And actually, I will draw on this made from the Cock Sharing Association, who have identified five foundational sharing policies in the city. And I think it will be the same for Bergen. And the main thing to, to get a shift from private car ownership to mobility as a system is actually to make it more difficult with 
personally, it was not in good ownership. And uh, I think that Bergen are already doing a great work in the direction, getting more, uh, what do you call it, uh, got zones where they have to pay for parking in the streets, and uh, also taking away parking lots in city center, making it uh, available for public spaces. So that, that's the main thing to do, make it more difficult having a private car ownership. But it's also to, to get more uh, incentive, incentives to join a car sharing association. It, uh, it's good to make uh, a framework for parking for car sharing. And actually, Bergen, the municipality of Bergen, is doing great work on that as well. They have established the uh, uh, Wienpunkt, where uh, we could have uh, electric vehicles. And actually, we want to have more parking spaces reserved for, for um, car sharing for our vehicles in public streets as well. That makes it so much easier and convenient to be a member of a car sharing uh, uh, company. And uh, a main issue is also to have it function to function is to make car sharing part of a larger mobility system. And uh, I think of that on two different levels. Uh, you could have a larger technological system like uh, you could integrate the different kind of transportations on the same platform. Uh, in Norway, we have, for instance, uh, Eantur, where you could choose uh, by different ways of uh, getting from one place to another and make the solution which is the best one. And uh, like Bildeleringen, we have our own digital platform and uh, to improve the choices for our members, we have integrated Bergen uh, in our platform, so uh, it's easier to plan and project your trip. But I think also uh, it's uh, important to make car sharing part of a larger system in terms of having different groups sharing the same cars. Like with all transportation, Bildelingen uh, also have peak hours, like uh, we have mostly private members using the cars during the weekends and during early afternoon. And uh, we are trying to get to more uh, business members that are using the cars during daytime. If we have more users during daytime, we will could we could have more vehicles available for our private members during the weekend, and it will be a better solution for all all the users. Could have lower prices and uh, more cars available. So actually, at the moment, we had some rumors that uh, the municipality of Bergen are going to take or want to have a car sharing as a part of their own uh, solution. And if we could have, we have already a lot of users from Bergen Commune, the municipality of Bergen, and uh, more uh, businesses using the cars on daytime. But if that part of it will increase, it will be a better solution for all all the inhabitants in Bergen, and I think uh, it's easier to sort of get rid of your private car park and go over to car sharing as a solution for your transport. So that's mainly the things I think uh, would be necessary to think about to 
get more people into using um, car sharing and uh, mobility as a system in the future. And um, I was also asked to say a bit about the expectations for the future. And um, as I said initially, Bildeleringen uh, has had a huge growth during the last uh, months. And uh, seen from all, all point of view, uh, the future look quite bright. <laughs> Uh, we actually expect the situation to continue and uh, the speaker we get, the more attractive and better known we get. And we have also developed our own digital platform, which I think is uh, quite useful when the situation are uh, changing rapidly. So, to stay on this road and uh, continue growing. I think it is important to continue the good collaboration with the municipality and uh, maybe get more places uh, so we could increase uh, uh, our number of electric vehicles. And Bildelringen uh, is a very flexible organization and could respond very fast to new situations and what will happen in the future, we don't know really what happened, but uh, we change very rapidly. And uh, we hope in the future to also reach out to new groups of people. So, I'm not really sure what the future will um, show up, or how the future will develop. We didn't know about uh, Corona and uh, COVID-19 the beginning of this year and it has changed the situation for us completely but if i should say to, something about uh, what should, could be uh, could be something that would be important for the future is maybe to to develop or sort of have a plan for a digital platform for mobility as a system with a lot of uh, system modes in the same application. We have, for instance, M2 at the moment. It could be M2, but it could also be other things, and maybe the municipality could think of developing one platform or integrate different platform, so you could have a, a mobility, where you could have the mobility for trips in Bergen. Yeah. Yeah, this is what I have been thinking about, and it's my contribution to this talk today. Thanks. Thank you, Toria. I think you were able to catch the last of the applause here, but uh, you had rapt attention. I think there's a bit of an echo that I'm causing from our end, so I'll reduce the volume on the speakers. Um, and I'll mute us when Wilfried speaks, but I think it slides very naturally into our next speaker, who is Wilfried Pimenta. He is uh, the founding CEO of, can you hear me, Wilfried? Yes, yeah. okay, great. Um, he's the founding CEO of a small medium enterprise called uh, Alpha Venturi, that's Oslo based, and also the business director of uh, the IOTA Foundation, which is a non-profit based in Germany that uh, works with distributed ledger technology, also often referred to as blockchain. And uh, since Tori just mentioned the need to integrate systems, um, I feel like uh, it's a privilege to have uh, Wilfried with us because this is something he can speak to both from a technological perspective but also from experience with a, a pilot in Trondheim. Is that right? And uh, over to you, Wilfried. Thanks, Phil. Do you hear me well? Yes. Okay, I'll try to share my screen first. Yep, you're good. Perfect, thanks a lot for uh, allowing me to speak and present the Mystify some of our work. <coughs> As you mentioned, I'm based uh, in the Oslo region now uh, with the different, uh, different hats. So Alpha Venture is a Norwegian uh, entity uh, that works in uh, towards the innovation domain, uh, helping to, to, to harvest some of the technology.
version that I will speak about today, which is IOTA, uh, which is uh, technology belonging to the blockchain domain. And uh, I'll, I'll focus on what we do uh, with IOTA in the smart e-mobility domain um, and provide you a few examples. A few words about the, the IOTA Foundation itself. Uh, the project was uh, originated from Norway, uh, but eventually was registered uh, in Germany. So we're not for profit, we're about 110 employees now, and we are one of the leading players in the, the so-called blockchain space. Uh, we provide something uh, that is uh, software, open source software, quite sophisticated, but acting as a protocol layer, a bit like, uh, you know, in the likes of the TCP IP when it comes to internet. So this is uh, a technology that belongs to the very low layers of the, the connected world. And we work in particular towards the Internet of Things. Um, as an organization, um, let's see, I'm just looking at what you're saying here. Act as 
single source of truth. So those are immutable databases. They're not meant to store raw data sets, but they are here to provide a unique signature scheme so that the data that is stored in different systems and different applications can start to interoperate a bit more easily. And the, that, the blockchain or distributed ledgers are used as single source of truth because they have a degree of immutability and we can store in there some signature footprints, if you want, unique identifiers to all those data sets that are distributed in different cloud environments. And we can utilize this distributed ledgers as single source of truth. And in technical words, we also talk about data integrity. It will be very important in the future to ensure data integrity as we share data from one silo to another, from one app to another through different APIs uh, architecture. We need to make sure that the data has not been corrupted or tampered with. So this notion of data integrity is really essential in the Internet of Things and smart city in general. And that's where it starts. And we can associate data integrity with another uh, list of other challenges around the centralized identity of objects, of machines, of people that are interact together. Uh, we're going to have challenges associated with personal data sharing. Generally, how do we ensure access uh, to different machines uh, to delegate the authority to act, for example, in the future autonomous electric vehicles. And so all those things belong to what I, I, I generalized into the, the digital trust bucket. This is going to be an increasing issue or challenge to cope with uh, in this new domain of smart city. And blockchain or distributed ledger, and IOTA in particular, is seen as an essential piece of the puzzle to, uh, to resolve those dilemmas. And the technology beyond just digital trust can also be utilized to facilitate a new approach to data monetization. Today, in, in, in all business models and, and in economic models, we always use central, uh, centralized systems and we go to the banks to orchestrate the payments between different entities and companies. But we know that there are some fees attached to those transactions and they're not very slow, but they're not very fast. And in the future, we contemplate a smart city environment where we will have a lot of peer-to-peer -peer exchanges Machines, autonomous electric vehicles, for example, will be empowered to trade directly with humans, but also with smart charging and other types of functionalities like parking. And we want to orchestrate what we call real-time payment or micro-payments. So those machines will be able to pay peer-to-peer -peer instantly, and this needs to be orchestrated very efficiently. And so our technology allows this to happen through machine-to-machine -machine payments. And one can make a sort of parallel. You have heard, of course, about Bitcoin, which is a bit controversial because the Bitcoin is utilized for the human to human money transfer, peer to peer. But what we have developed is a technology that we can apply to the machine environment, so, so to the IoT, so, so that the machines that are connected can actually pay one another. So that really opens up the gates to much broader domain which around automation and decentralized marketplaces, and I'll talk also about this in the context of mobility. So I have uh, gathered a, a few examples of some of the work we do with different stakeholders. Uh, the first one is uh, around uh, EV charging and machine-to-machine -machine payment. Uh, the second one is around car wallet technology. Uh, the third is related to a new feature on smart charging, which would be to, to bring a green traceability to the energy supply. So let's call it green smart charging. Um, and I'll talk also about peer-to-peer uh, -peer energy trading in smart city and how we can link that to vehicle-to-grid setups. And now I'll, I'll end up giving some perspective about the future of, of platforms uh, that was mentioned by Tori around mobility as a service. So some of the work that we do with our ecosystem uh, touch to this idea of car wallet technology. So Jaguar and Rover, uh, is, uh, is collaborating with the IOLA Foundation to develop a proprietary car wallet technology that will allow the vehicle to pay as, you, as it goes, in a way, per use. So the vehicle will be able itself, with a wallet inside the vehicle, to pay for charging or for tolls or what's called the road user charges. So in a way, the vehicle could pay as it goes through the city and 
pay for the kilometers that is driving on. And we can allow much more flexibility in setting different tarifications, for example. The vehicle can also pay for parking and other things. It's not only about payment, so the vehicle could actually get paid as well for transmitting different traffic and congestion data, identifying potholes in the street, uh, and other types of, uh, of formats around mobility as a service, and of course shared mobility. Uh, so those developments are, are taking place uh, at the, the research centers of our, uh, our project while well over in Ireland. And we have the opportunity to bring some of those vehicles for some showcase demonstration uh, in Norway last summer. When you have a car wallet technology, you can basically start to think about new sorts of application. And so in the context of smart charging, um, this was actually a, a prototype done before the car wallet technology I showed you. Um, but it sort of exploits this idea so that the vehicle, here it's a mini Tesla, back then that was the first prototype. So the mini Tesla has the car wallet technology. Um, the charger is designed as a prototype that accepts IOLA payment. And through the R system, we have what's called machine to machine instant payment. So as you plug your vehicle to the charger, a payment is done in the form of a cryptocurrency and it's done at zero fee. And this is done instantly, that means when you unplug the cable, the payment has already been done. It's not registered in the booking for a payment at the end of the month. The payment is instantly done using this idea of data monetization based on cryptocurrency of the IOLA blockchain or distributed ledger. And this will in the future scale to different types of formats. And you can imagine, of course, an autonomous electric vehicle interested in charging itself to a local charging points and being able to do that through direct machine to machine payment. And that will open a lot of uh, possibilities and it corresponds to this vision we call the machine to machine economy. So where you have an automation that is deployed that applies to the mobility sector. You can combine those different technologies. We did a demo last summer uh, in Jordan asking some of our partners, uh, like uh, Jaguar and Rover, of course, and G-Lab, which is the R&D center of the big energy operator from France, and we collaborated with Entra and Powerhouse on a project for CT Exchange that I'll, I'll mention afterwards. And what we did is we combined those different blocks, power wallets, smart charging, and a new layer around energy traceability, so that we could allow the vehicle you see here, uh, the I-Pace, the Jaguar I-Pace, to have a car wallet installed and selecting green charging was a possibility. So the idea is that the vehicle would only charge if the electricity is coming from a green source. So the ability to trace where the energy is coming from is, could be valued and monetized and we could tag things like the green attribute or uh, the origin if it comes from the local community for example, you could apply different types of, of monetization or valuation. And that brings us to a bigger picture, which comes to where mobility meets energy. So some of the work we do relates to the transformation of the energy system, where we could take a passive environment, like you see in gray on the left, and the idea is to empower this into a much more dynamic and positive energy environment, where you put solar panels on rooftops, you put charging uh, stations, you have electric vehicles, even electric ferries. So this is a vision we developed through the city exchange for the city of Trondheim. And we have joined a consortium of 32 partners all together to demonstrate the possibility to do peer-to-peer -peer energy trading in different test beds in the city of Trondheim. And so together with Powell, with the city of Trondheim, and Tender is managing the project, we are using our technology to show how a building could pay another building for its excess energy. And you have a connection to mobility because you have charging points, for instance, at the bottom of the powerhouse of Entra, where you will have the ability to charge. And you will have also batteries that are allocated to this district so that you could have a self-balancing effect. So in that setup, we really have a self-sufficient energy district where all the different components are helping one another to have a very efficient outcome. And in that setup, you can have vehicle to grid setups where the vehicles will participate to manage the grid. So 
charging back electricity to the network when it's required and when there's a specific peak for energy demand. So it's a very sophisticated system, and the project has already been tagged as a high potential candidate for innovation on different fronts. There's a lot of social innovation components in there, but of course there's a peer-to-peer -peer energy trading platform to which we are associated with, which is very exciting. And, and the last example that I wanted to mention is, is taking a step really towards the future, uh, where we may include even things like autonomous electric vehicles or mobility as a service. So IOTA, as a, as a technology provider, provides the, the blockchain layer, let's say the distributed ledger layer, but helps also develop some open source blueprints that can be further developed. And one of them is the industry marketplace. It's a decentralized vendor neutral platform where human and machines can all securely exchange different products and services. And so you could register, for example, different mobility uh, vehicles, some of which could even be autonomous, you could even have drones and so on, and it can allow the marketplace to be operated. And uh, the function of the DLT is to provide integrity of data so that we can all rely on a common source of truth when it comes to the data handling. Things cannot be changed and corrupted, and it can also help facilitate the payment through a very efficient system to the extent where we could even allow micro payments for some of those applications. And so, altogether, what we are very interested in doing uh, as IOTA Foundation, and of course with the help of Alpha Venturi uh, in Norway, is to find suitable test beds and partners that are interested to explore further the possibilities uh, in the mobility sector, in the energy sector. Altogether, I think Smart City represents a really interesting landscape. Um, so that's what I have to share. Some of those things are quite technical, so I hope I didn't <laughs> uh, lost you too much. I'm happy to clarify any questions you may have. Thanks a lot. Including myself, or to be honest. <laughs> um, Sid, the boss of this. Um, how much time? We're a bit behind schedule. Let's take five minutes. Um, so I will. Uh, are there any pressing questions from uh, from the audience to the speakers? I have a pressing question, um, and um, I, I want to. Can can the two of you? Um, Hear me, Turi and Wilfred? Yeah, yeah. You can hear me well? Okay. So, um, there are lots of, of, uh, of great opportunities here and lots of, uh, lots of possibilities uh, using technology, but also quite familiar uh, things, uh, less technological solutions uh, to, to improve the transport system. Uh, and if, as I think all of you touched on to a certain degree, uh, I mean, the, a key element here is, of course, the human and, uh, and humans, people. We all know that, that people have quite a, uh, uh, an attachment, at least some people have a very strong attachment to their, to their personal car. Um, how do we get the people on board with this? And I'm thinking particularly um, people who maybe live outside the city center, uh, people who will not come to seminars like this. Um, how, do we, how do we make these, these sorts of changes and possibilities um, uh, attractive for, 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 for um, um, yeah, for, for a wide section of the population. Um, would you like to start talking about that, uh, Russian? And then I can come back to the other two. But keep in mind, we only have five minutes, so... Uh, <laughs> yeah. Take my phone of the camera so they can see me. Sure. Yeah? Hello. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's a million dollar question. How do we get people on board? And uh, we touched upon it. Some pressure, some restrictions, something about making things uh, private car ownership expensive, but also the carrots, you know, uh, and, uh, and and the communication about it all is a big thing, you know. It has to tap into the. I mean, the, the private car uh, uh, industry has been very good at tapping into our feelings and our uh, uh, freedom uh, desires and all things and those things. And we have to do that when it comes to sharing as well. And people 
They need to try it. They need to get on board. They need to see it. They need to talk to their neighbors doing it and hear the good stories. So, yeah. Great. Thank you. That's a really pointed uh, and short question. Thank you so much. Uh, Wilfred, do you have any thoughts on this? And then I go to Tuli afterwards. Yeah, I think I mean, we come more from the sort of technical angle, so um, or enabling them. So it may be uh, a bit difficult. I think our experience is that it, it needs to be run in test beds uh, in order to just test the reaction. There's a lot of unknown. And so what we've done, even on the energy front, the front end, is to really have a living lab approach to put the, in the hands of consumers and so we can see what happens. Uh, there are some uh, prospects in the future. Um, where we basically develop mobility as a service approach. Sometimes the vehicle itself is actually not the only way of going from B to Z. We need to combine it. Um, and some of the things we do is to at least facilitate um, uh, so what's called a you know, multimodal mobility. So we can link the journey all together and provide a service of access and seamless sort of travel all the way through. And so there's new solutions around this that are inspiring. Thank you, and Tori. Yeah, hope to get more people using car sharing. Was that the question? Or yes, yeah. yes, that's a, that's a way to ask the question, yeah. Yeah, and um, I think it's not for us a technological question, it's uh, just uh, we need to have cars available where people are living, and uh, we are trying to reach out to the people who are not using the cars too much and too little, like uh, there is a kind of window. Our solution is not, it's not a solution for people who need to use the car to get to, to work every day, but if you could use public transport, bicycling, and uh, then uh, car sharing would be a very good solution. Yeah, so, so it's just having cars available. Just a follow-up question, Natalia. Um, you talked about uh, the COVID situation and how uh, you have, was it 50% increase in members during uh, the COVID situation? Not, not members, it's a 30% increase in members and 50% yeah. in use since uh, June, June, right. July, August, yeah. How, how do you explain this, uh, I mean, what is the connection with COVID? Is that people all had vacations in Norway and wanted to use the car or what? Yeah, how do you, yeah. yeah it's, it's kind of positive and kind of negative. It's uh, during the summer, it's that uh, everybody was supposed to have a vacation in Norway. Yeah. But uh, the growth has continued. And as we have got more members, uh, it's, we got more users and people getting to know car sharing. So uh, it could be a, a positive effect in the future. Right. But right. also that people actually are using less public transport. Right. Yes, I'm a, I'm a member of car sharing wing, and I know this past few months has been quite it's, it's been more difficult to get a car. So I have all, all these people sign off again, so I yeah. can have a car for myself. No, no, no. We, we actually we increased with 70 cars during June, so the situation today is quite good. Yeah, yeah but we had problems with this summer. Great, I'll turn it back to you, uh, Sid. Okay, thank you to, again to uh, all the four speakers for an amazing presentation. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, and, and thanks for joining us, uh, Wilfried and Tori. We will uh, have you back on again for the panel discussion where Tori is uh, a part, participating at the end. And, uh, Wilfred, you're welcome to join us then as well if you have the time. But I think we'll sign yeah. off uh, with you for now and be back yeah. in 40 minutes. Yeah. Bye. Right. Great. Yeah. Um, thank you. So, as long as I can get the right screen up, I have uh, a couple of things to say. Does that work? All right, this is, uh, this is where we left off. New technology transitions. Okay. All right, um, I'm, I'm going to follow instructions and uh, also make a suggestion. So um, we will take a little break now just so everybody can
have five minutes without us uh, crowding you with lots of uh, thoughts. But, um, but let me say what we'll do right after. Um, we have this project or research program that Howard mentioned, and, um, and we'd like to take you into it. So there are, you've, you've heard from Howard and me, but really two of the people who've been working on this a lot over the past month are uh, Amber Nodwell, who's sitting here, and uh, Devin Lemme. They're both research assistants on the project, and, uh, and so we want to use the chance to hear from them next a little bit about what they've been doing with collecting data, with getting this kind of conversation going, and also hear a bit more of a user perspective. So let's give it five minutes. Uh, just if you want a coffee refill um, and so on, we might want to start from the back and go row by row so it's not everybody at the same time. And then we'll hear from Amber and Devin and uh, come back to a panel session. Right. So, so what we're going to do now is to hear about some of the work that uh, we've started over the past month or so on the theme of, of just mobility transitions. And we call it Just Mob, which is an interesting play on the kind of discussions and how they tend to get heated up um, or put into different kinds of slots um, and become conversations about very specific subjects such as bomb finger or about uh, uh, e-scooters. And we want to see whether it's possible for us to arrive at ways of understanding these many really big challenges around urban mobility transitions. There's, we've heard about digitalization, we've heard about different platforms, we've heard about technological evolution, but also the challenge of a cultural shift, a shift in the vision of what mobility is for Bergen. And that's really something that we know quite a lot about from urban mobility studies over decades. And yet, you could say it's a moving target because um, we've heard that the Comuna has a vision for 2030, but we also know that some of these technologies and possibilities and platforms are really changing as we speak. And, uh, and one of the things that we know from the literature on this, and there are several people at, uh, at SET and at Geography, beyond the ones directly involved here who have also been working with these teams, we know that often the perspective of users and their everyday experiences is one of the hardest things to get at. We make decisions, we have time-bound targets. How do we actually know whether these are useful for the users of the service, if mobility is a service? How do we know that, what way to exactly change systems that are large, complex, but also really imbricated, really um, an essential part of our everyday practices? Because these practices are not the same for all of us, and we embody sort of, we occupy our own universe. So we thought of uh, design, and I've said it's knowledge code production using participatory methods here on the slide. And, and so we thought of a design where we would try to understand, get some baseline information on the ways in which people think of mobility, what kind of modes they use, um, for what purposes, and then do some more granular work trying to get what we call thick description in the social sciences on what the actual needs are, what it looks like to interact with these systems, to use them for particular purposes, the challenges, and so on. So we're using a variety of techniques. Um, the first one, Amber is going to speak with you about um, that's a small scale survey where uh, she has been working at getting over 100 responses to a questionnaire uh, at, at very specific uh, places in the city. And, uh, and then Devin will take over after to talk about some focus groups where we held group discussions on particular topics within urban mobility transitions in Berlin. So over to you. Okay, it sounds good. Okay, uh, yeah. So I'm Amber. I'm a research assistant on the on the project, and so we uh, designed a survey, and then uh, I was the one to implement it. And so, um, uh, quick notes about the survey: uh, it was an anonymous survey. People had the option to do it on their smartphones or on paper. And uh, I conducted the survey at three different locations um, in the city center, Osana Terminalen, and Ladapio Terminalen. And at each location, I did three shifts, morning, midday, and afternoon. And uh, I certainly tried to ask everyone, um, but uh, you know, samples have a way of uh, skewing. So here you can see that the largest demographic ended up being um, 
18 to 25 year old uh, women with about a high school degree. So we did collect some um, demographic data on them so we would know who we were uh, talking with. And, uh, and then beyond that, it was a uh, public opinion uh, survey on public transportation. So we had 113 respondents and, uh, and let's see, um, and uh, we wouldn't call it a statistically representative sample, but it is a nice uh, cross-section to see who's coming through these stations and uh, what they think about particular things. So uh, we asked about um, the frequency of use on public transportation and also about car ownership. So uh, this survey just wrapped up. I'm still in the process of uh, processing a lot of the data, but I'm comparing different elements uh, just to see if there's interesting patterns that come up. So, um, so this is certainly probably not surprising. People who don't own cars use, uh, they, they were there in high amounts and use uh, public transportation quite frequently. There was quite, um, I only caught uh, five electric car owners in the whole sample. So um, thinking about like what um, Lars said uh, earlier, uh, that might be an interesting thing to investigate further. Uh, so these are three examples of questions that we used. Um, so we wanted to know about uh, whether climate concerns factor into people's choice of transport. Uh, we wanted to know if, if they thought it was fair that uh, toll charges are increasingly financing public transport over uh, roads and bridges. And uh, we also were um, asking them about whether uh, free transportation funded by taxpayers was a good idea. And on these questions, uh, it was a 90 to 93% positive response to various degrees. Uh, so that, that was uh, interesting, especially since um, uh, there is quite a variation amongst um, political groups. We, we did ask about uh, political party affiliation as well. Um, so these, these particular topics, people seem to be in, in agreement in, at least for this cross-section. And uh, we asked about what, what's the most important reason to use public transportation. Uh, these were the three options we gave people to tick, um, or the three most uh, checked options. And uh, so, you know, I have no other option was the most popular one. But this question was interesting because uh, with every question we had a space for people to write in uh, if, if they had something to add, and this one, by and far inspired the most responses. And a couple of the interesting ones are to avoid bump hanger, uh, they don't need to get a driver's license, um, it's more reasonable than a car during rush hour, and uh, it's a cheaper solution that helps create a car-free center. So interesting that uh, people are thinking about that. And so here's the political party uh, breakdown. So as you can see, the most popular party is the no answer party. Uh, so there was quite a few who just did not want to answer this question. They thought, even though it was an anonymous survey, uh, but beyond that, um, we did get lots of answers from different uh, parties. Uh, the one party we got no answer on was the FND party, the Knights of Bumpinger party. Uh, so, you know, hard to say if um, we just didn't catch any of those or if they're in the no answer category. Um, but uh, we seem to get representation from all the other main parties and then a few write ins as well. And uh, so we asked these different questions about fairness in public transportation. And so uh, on this one, um, this is asking about the fairness of a flat fee to ride um, bus in Bibana, whether you're going uh, just through this city center to city center, or if you're going all the way um, out to Osama. It's all the same charge. And so you can, uh, blue represents yes, and so everyone seemed to think that that was pretty fair. Uh, I've been breaking down data this way because I wanted to see, well, there are some no responses. Is it all um, in one group of, of people or from one perspective? But on this particular one, uh, no, that, that seems to be somewhat dispersed as well. So uh, I'm still processing it. Like I said, we just wrapped this up. Um, and uh, so next steps are to triangulate this information with existing uh, justice and mobility studies uh, and literature. So we can uh, have a baseline for what to investigate further. Thank you. Devin, I'm going to tell you 
a little bit about uh, focus groups that we held two weeks ago. Uh, in these first three focus groups, we had an open call for participation, and the next step will be to organize some with more targeted groups, so for example, um, retirees. Um, so in these focus groups, we wanted people to share their subjective experiences of moving around in the city, and we did a few exercises to that end, and also to sort of trans transcend the um, traditional transportation planning based on logistics uh, to get at these, uh, as Sid mentioned, uh, thick data. So the first exercise we did was have people draw on these maps of Bergen, and yellow is where they feel like they have easy access to, and in red is uh, where they avoid going, which could be because they felt like it's hard to get to, or it could be any other reason they avoid those areas. Um, and yeah, so we have, the one in the corner is a bicyclist, and I thought it was interesting that she avoids the uh, center entirely, <laughs> but everywhere else was accessible to her. Um, and then here we have our, our walkers. Um, another exercise we did was have people uh, just call out words that come to their minds uh, in relation to the e-scooters appearing on the streets of Bergen. So this got a lot of excitement and uh, mostly negative. Um, and it definitely pulled out a debate about who has the right to the city and the allocation of space in the city. So we had a lot of participants who their primary mode of transport or mobility is walking in the city and preferably walking unhindered. So there was a lot of frustration that e-scooters and also going into the car debate that they take up too much space in the city and that they are irresponsible use of city space. And a frustration that the, the government hadn't been able to um, reel them in. <laughs> Um, yeah, so the, the walkers also expressed that they value walking beyond just a mode of getting from A to B, but it's an activity in and of itself for them, um, which is something that I think planners uh, are hoping to figure out how to encourage in more people this glad uh, Um yeah, so the overall majority of our participants expressed a high satisfaction with mobility in Bergen, with the uh, planning, with the services, with the infrastructure, but there were some concerns, and a primary one was everyone who bicycles in the city is um, quite frustrated about bicycle paths, and the feeling that there's been a lot of lip service paid to how they're, they, the city wants people to bicycle, and they're going to build paths, but where are they? Um, for people who don't live in the center, there was uh, a lot of people who expressed the frustration of having to transfer lines. Um, not that it should always be one line that gets them home, but that the stress of trying to plan these trips and the worry that if you miss your trans transfer to a bus or a ferry, we had a few people from Oskoy, um, that that could set you back an hour or more and there was no participants who res reported a, a high level of trust in the SHIS app or <laughs> felt like it was making their lives easier the way that they would like it to. Um, also, people outside the center particularly felt like their concerns weren't heard by um, decision makers and, and SHIS particularly. Uh, we had one participant who said she must have responded to 20 surveys over the years and nothing had ever changed except for one thing that got worse. Um, and that they, she did not want to drive a car, but she owned one because she felt like it wasn't really possible to not have a car and, and have any kind of mobility in the city to get to the city. Uh, another hot topic was feeling unsafe on public transportation now during the, the corona situation. So, uh, all of our participants seemed to think it was um, a good idea to at least have a recommended uh, face masks during rush hour, 
And actually, a lot of people felt that it would be best if it was a requirement. And one participant expressed this best by saying, if you are a vulnerable person, you have to get off the bus. But if there were rules in place, the people who are not taking Henson, uh, taking care, would be the ones that you could ask to get off the bus. But there was a general sense that there's a lack of clarity over whose responsibility this is, whether it should be, you know, some people said it should be bus drivers, some people said the government, some people shiss. Um, but the, the finding is that people were confused um, and, and really would have preferred to have more leadership on this. Um, yeah, so an, another exercise we did was have people read uh, the announcement that just put out about the reduced uh, offer during the summer. And it was interesting that people who don't rely on the bus uh, felt like this was a very reasonable announcement to make. They understood completely where the company was coming from. People who really rely on the bus felt like it wasn't good enough and it's a frustrating response and they wanted more. So one line of thinking is that the people who made this decision, are they relying on the services that they are taking decisions on? Um, and either way, does that matter? Uh, finally, we talked a little bit about digitalization and a lot of people reported that it was something they don't think about very much at all. Um, we had one more active participant who was concerned that it, it's becoming impossible to move around in the city without being digitally tracked, and that there wasn't a lot of transparency about what data is being collected and where it ends up and what it's used for. Um, so those are our preliminary findings from these focus groups, and uh, we've got some lines of flight to investigate. Thank you. We will, we're trying to keep the schedule so we make sure we wrap up by 3.30, but, uh, but we would like to give you a chance and to hear from you and uh, to take questions around the room and so on. Um, so there's, and there's a bit of a limitation in switching mics and that sort of thing, which makes, <laughs> make, makes it a bit challenging to, to do it with everyone today. But if, if there are any protests to this suggestion, say it now, but if not, then uh, what we thought would we do next is to have uh, Lars over back with us to talk us through a, a, an activity that we were hoping to have Leah Oppedal, who has this uh, role here, but she's uh, not able to join us today um, due to health reasons, um, which is the, the planning of car-free zones in the city. And there are people in the room I recognize who have also worked with studying the case that we have, which is in Molenbrees, but now Bergen Kumun has the ambition to expand this to to other zones in the city. So it's a fascinating topic, and Larko has uh, worked with this for quite a while now. So he will talk us through this briefly, after which we will move directly into a panel discussion where we take up the idea of digitalization, which has come up a few times, but take it up with Lars Petter Klem, and I will introduce you right now so that I don't have to keep coming back up. Um, you are a project leader, at, also at Bumilio Etappen, and, um, and so you have been working first with, um, with us at Geography a couple of years ago at, and done masters and then you have moved into this role and, uh, and, and we will have you in conversation with, uh, with Tori who, um, from Deep Dinneringen who we heard from earlier and uh, Devin will be leading that panel discussion. But first over to uh, Lars Boa for a, a little ride through the car free planning. I, I'll give you the here, here, and just kind of point it out. Well, thanks for having me again. Did you hold that one? Yep.
try to. Uh... <laughs> okay. Oh. I guess they heard you. <laughs> so I'll try to uh, make um, 15 minutes down to uh, five. Well, that's the right button. Yeah, big strong team. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes, car-free zones. What are those? It sounds very uh, strict, big car-free zones. Um, I'll say a few words about that. And um, it, it could be a place close to cars, that's what most people think. But uh, I like the term that um, Philip Christ from the uh, International uh, Transport uh, that made the Lisbon report, he uses a car, he plays with a word, you call it car free, you can be carefree more carefree place, or car light place. We're getting there. It's a, it's a gradual process to uh, reduce the space used for cars, opening up for other use in areas. And we are currently working on, um, oops, that was a bit fast. Do you see it? Yeah. Four areas and planning going into others as well. Um, with a, a different uh, approach on each, um, trying out different methods, different order of things. Um, but something is common for all of them. It's about, as I've been talking about before, removing street parking. Sometimes with an alternative, sometimes without an alternative in place, and see what happens. And uh, adding new services, creating spaces for people and, and working on what should we fill these spaces with. And to do that, we need to engage with citizens in a very um, explorative and systematic way, if that's possible, <laughs> both of them. Just a few examples from um, this we've been working on for the longest time. There we're going in sort of reverse order because there was an entrepreneur there digging up all the streets and we were giving the opportunities to put in place a few easy to plan uh, measures in this round while they were there. Um, and then we're taking a step back, zooming out and planning for the whole area. So we've been uh, replacing a lot of street parking with uh, mobility hubs or other services. Um, we created some shared, new shared spaces, got the tune uh, like things. Uh, and we've been the, the, the people that live in Memphis are really nice to work with. They've been doing a lot of things themselves. Um, for example, collaborating with the architect students, uh, making this festival under the bridge uh, in a dull, underused area that could be turned into something nice for people. Um, we are trying now to, to test out some in the, in the sort of planning period, testing out temporary measures in the streets, where we can do that, and see how it works, and then when it comes to uh, building, we, we can do it more permanently. Um, and uh, some of it uh, is creating activity around the new space. This is with uh, Vibum, the city farmer. You can See that video for yourself on YouTube. A nice little glimpse of how to use the, the new shared space in the Vedanskap in Memphis, where uh, people have adopted each their own planters. Uh, and it's been, they've turned it into a really nice place. You can see it yourself. And uh, uh, in Memphis, the citizens themselves have also made an a umbrella organization, a common forum for all the uh, organizations there. Uh, to ensure that everyone is included, it's open for everyone, and they also explore digital tools to get in feedback from from um, the citizens. We've been out there having a street office at the cafes there. That was really nice, sitting down, talking to people, just getting what they think and feel about the project. We've been into schools, uh, engaging with the teachers there. Um, both in IT and arts, um, 
we explore how to the children's view on the streets and how they're used are really, really fascinating. I could talk a lot about that. Um, yeah. So now when we are moving into other areas of, as well, we are setting up a, a joint a collaboration with the Department for Culture, Diversity and Equality on um, using uh, culture in these processes for the new uh, car light or car free zones. Um, uh, we are uh, exploring how we can use art in the streets. Um, and for uh, just to give you an example on how we are now working when we, we're going into the more sort of zooming out of the whole area systematic approach. Now I mentioned a lot of, you know, testing out things, get, getting uh, experience that will guide our next steps. Uh, I'll show you this area that we are in right now. Nico Scheiden, we've been working on. Uh, that's the different approach when we're talking about biking, we're talking about car sharing and so on, looking at the whole city. Here we're looking at uh, area, I mean, looking at all the different things of that area. It's the trees, uh, sewage, water management, um, mobility hubs, parking, all sort of things, Tr or accessibility to integrate them. So this is the, uh, on its way to political uh, processing, uh, but this is, has been worked out. A lot of new uh, shared spaces, a lot of new trees, um, four or five new mobility hubs, the first one is being built now in uh, near the Nigua. So this is uh, a picture of what we're trying to do when we work with many things in, in one area. And the next round is to uh, get out into the suburbs and districts uh, to do some investigations and then develop car-free, car-light zones tailored to those needs, tailored to the, that area. Yeah, looking at Oslo, and yet, as you can see, also on different challenges. So, that's uh, what it means for us now, to create, removing parking, adding new services, creating spaces for people, engaging and mobilizing citizens, and we are really interested in your projects and ideas and was really interested to hear from your research. Leah Oppedal, uh, I was supposed to say hello to all of you, many of you know her. Uh, she is the one to contact. Thank you. today, in order to tackle climate change in any kind of just way, we humans, together with our machines, are going to need to coordinate like never before. And digitalization is going to play a huge role in this. So let's start with a, a little definition. Digitalization means representing real world materialities, situations, and processes in data form. And these representations are getting more and more complex through a massive proliferation of sensors. And we make these digital models or, or digital worlds to help us make decisions, but increasingly to, uh, they, they're impacting our lives in more direct ways through, for example, automation and smart contracts and behavior shaping. So here we see a risk that as geographers like to say, you might be confusing the map for the territory. 
yet there is such big potential here that we need to explore. So for example, the sharing economy requires digital platforms that increase trust between strangers and makes resources available. Um, digital platforms and incentive schemes can be used to nudge people towards more sustainable options. And there's going to be a digital backbone to the electrification of public transportation that coordinates the whole fleet and also the use of energy as our entire society electrifies. So we have uh, Lars here from the municipality and uh, Tori on Skype. So I wanted to start by asking you, Tori, you had this huge spike in users, um, but how did you handle that technologically? Did you have any issues scaling up or were you ready to just absorb this big spike? Actually, we were completely ready. Uh, we got our own digital platform last year, uh, which is serving us very well. So our main problem was actually to get uh, get new cars from Europe because uh, there was a massive lockdown in Europe during uh, the first period of uh, the COVID-19 crisis. So they were not producing any cars. So all of the problems was sort of outside our control. Yeah. So at the moment we, we could uh, easily like uh, having the double members and parts available in Bergen with no problems, no problem for us to scale up. Great to hear. <laughs> um, yeah. So you suggested earlier that the municipality could develop a platform that would engage all of these different um, mobility options. Is that something the municipality is looking at? Is that within your purview? Definitely should be something we, <laughs> I don't know if we are right now, but we should, if not. Uh, I think we, if we consider mobility as a service, which we've been talking about today, uh, we should think about making it as little hassle as, as possible for people to change between, between uh, mobility services. Meaning if you come by car or you come by train, perhaps from Oslo to Bergen, you can catch on and jump on one of the Lillingen's cars at once at the uh, station, for example. And uh, that shouldn't be too far away in the future, if not, shouldn't be there by next year, perhaps, I don't know. I don't think uh, uh, and old NSP is working with that project in Oslo right now. I think it's working and it's uh, really a free-floating service and uh, uh, it's not too far ahead of us. And uh, again, I, I, I think you should have a mobility card. You shouldn't be like a, you're, you're um, having one. It's like when you have your Netflix, you have Amazon Prime, you have Disney now, and I mean all these services. And we get talking about that. Should be we are uh, having one uh, one account, and uh, as with Wheelfred show the, the car pays at once. So when you use the service, you pay and don't think about it. That's that's as simple as should be. And if you can get there, I think we'll be uh, one way ahead. And that's uh, making it easier for the customers as well is um, really important. And I think that's something we, uh, technology is there now, but often it's uh, used by us, the youth, right? Because we can have uh, technology. And yesterday I heard a story from uh, uh, Alte in uh, Trondheim. Uh, that's the public transport company up there. And every day uh, their customer service receives a call from an elderly person asking, um, how do I use the app to pay for a ticket, right? And we could just love that, right? Oh, it's so easy, just pushing the button. But there's a lot of people who's not following up on that technology. And if you can, uh, every chance you have to make these transactions easier, it's good for the whole company. Does the municipality have any um, uh, approaches to including elderly people, or, or we, we could say digital immigrants? <laughs> That's a good term. Um, I think that just showed me uh, um, one important thing, being out there. Uh, we get data from we, the must, I mean, we get all this data from, we can get data from value view security, you can see the travel habits there. We're trying to get some data from Riot, perhaps, I don't know, maybe we get, or from the Alex Cruz one time. Uh, we get uh, data from uh, car usage and field letting in, I guess you also have data, right? Uh, but we must always remember to ask ourselves um, who is not represented in these data and how can you get to them. 
And meeting them physically like you did with this car uh, pre-city project is the best way, I guess. And uh, as long as uh, not everyone is represented in our data, we have to get, get to them somehow. Hmm. Can you say a little more about uh, must that came up a little bit earlier? Uh, okay, so I started with not to go. So uh, <laughs> <laughs> I think my drawing, my job. Uh, but I worked in the Vestal field before, and must is a part of Vestal field as well. Uh, but uh, Rasul, do you want to do this? Take this one, or so it's a cooperation, right, between the municipality and the uh, state authorities and uh, the county to. Uh, collect all data you can get from all these sensors, and in the future perhaps we need more sensors, we get a lot of that data. But how can we make this data to knowledge that's uh, useful for us and for inhabitants? Uh, and I think that's the purpose of MUST, to start processing all the data we get from all these sensors, and then we can start to make uh, good decisions, hopefully. <laughs> that's correct. Mention the three labs, if I can do this. Live, uh, microphone. It's a, a meeting place, uh, Inno Lab, and it's a data lab, all the data you mentioned, and, but it's also a living lab, making the city available, the streets, the areas, for good new mobility solutions, making it Bergen the preferred place to test out things. Now, right, came a bit. Quick on us, but we'll get in there. We'll be ready next time. Yeah. So when it comes to policy and these regulatory uh, gaps, what are the principles that guide you in terms of um, making rules for technology we're not exactly sure is going to play out yet? Uh, for example, blockchains or uh, automated cars. Is it a wait and see kind of thing, or you, you go, Tony? Hey, could you ask me? Could you ask again? Yes, and, and you um, have the experience from the other end of this, uh, yeah. how policies uh, deal with new technologies and what the principles are that, that guide them. Is it is it more of a sit back and wait for it to become a reality and then regulate? What was your experience developing Bilirin? Uh, actually, we were not so much into the future as the blockchain. It's a it's a more simple system, uh, and we are all system. It's uh, when we were de developing it, it was uh, integrated with the members, and uh, we want it as easy to handle both for the administration and the members. They get to the only main point of view was to make it so easy as possible to find a viable car, but it's not very fast forward technology, but it's like it could develop if uh, the circumstances are changing. But if we're still using payment by invoicing, at the moment we are working with the, to the, get the onboarding with the kids. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, so it's not the, like blockchain is a bit uh, kind of fixed for us at the moment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I have. Is it wrong? No. All right, now, yeah. So, good to be I mean, uh, everyone is talking about uh, blockchain, and I think 1% of us understand completely what blockchain means. But what I come to my, uh, figure out is it's uh, one way of handling the security issue that we have today. Uh, and it's crucial that we have security uh, in front of us all the time. I mean, the government was hacked yesterday, wasn't it, two days ago? And um, uh, if blockchain is the way that can handle anonymous data, uh, then uh, that's, that's great. Um, and uh, what was the question again? <laughs> um, so what, what are the principles that uh, you at the municipality work with in terms of regulating these kind yeah. of edge technologies? Yeah, I mean, it's uh, the fun thing uh, about working in a municipality is that we are uh, working at the ground with stuff, right? So we want to push forward and that's the privilege of being working in a municipality in a city. That's, it's a perfect lab, pilot place, right? But sometimes when you want to pilot, you're not allowed. 
because of national laws, the policy framework, right? Uh, on my own part, I'm a project leader for something called Zero Emission Zones. Uh, uh, we show the document, the policy document from 2016, Grön Strategy. And there they say that we should have zero emission zones by 2020 in the center of Bergen. It's 2020, uh, the first of, or the third of September now, and we not yet <laughs> have zero emission zones. And uh, the reason for this is, um, you could say technology, of course, but technology is coming. And I mean, in Alstå Schenke, a huge logistics uh, company, they are able to um, turn the whole ring tre, like the maybe bigger inner circle of Alstå by electric vehicles. I mean, technology is there. Um, but we cannot ban uh, fuel, fuel uh, fossil fuel cars, right? Combustion engine. And that's because the uh, framework, the law framework, is not uh, it's not that easy to mold, to make it into how we need it to be, and it makes it hard to pilot. But also, I mean, innovation comes from when you have regulations, right? I think Porter said that, I remember from Geography lesson one time. Uh, yeah. But, um, yeah. Just to clarify, we, we can't ban uh, using fossil fuel cars, but we do have a regulation, or correct me if I'm wrong, about not being able to buy them soon. 2025? Yes, 2025. Uh, is it a goal or is it it's a goal? So, I mean, a goal is something different than <laughs> my law. Ah. Uh, that's our goal and intentions, and we're all trying to work towards realizing that uh, goal. Uh, in the law, the law, it says uh, we can ban cars, but I need uh, authorization from prime, uh, not the prime minister, the uh, minister of uh, transport. It needs to give a go. What I can do, I can. Uh, we can put toll on uh, fossil fuel cars, which we already do to some, some extent, and we can put make even smaller zones in the city centre. Uh, but that's only if there are issues with. Um, Roof, uh, the local, the air, or air pollution. If there's high air pollution levels, then I can do ban or put high uh, taxes on me, toll. Uh, but I'm not allowed due to CO2 because that's a uh, global pollution, global pollution. So there's the difference between local pollution and global pollution, and that's bureaucracy for you. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, so, how much of your fleet in Biltaringen is um, electric? Uh, at the moment, it's uh, 40 percent, uh, and uh, our users are very fond of driving electric vehicles. But uh, we have a problem because we need parking space where uh, we could have lot in full bus position. Oh, charging. Yeah, charging. Yeah. So uh, as as fast as we got, uh, we get uh, parking spaces with the charging. We could uh, increase our fleet with electric vehicles. It's no user problem at all. Their user are very fond and over electric vehicles. Yeah. So it's the we just need the infrastructure. And that so that's something you work with the municipality on. Yeah, but we have a dialogue, so yeah, we're working on it. How are we doing for time, sir? Okay. <laughs> so. What has been the biggest challenge for uh, building Ringen and your expansion? Uh, what would be our biggest challenge? Yeah, was it regulatory, technological, people's behavior? Uh, when? Oh, um, how to phrase that? Um, were there, what, does it come to mind any big barriers that you had to overcome to sort of realize this dream of car sharing in Bergen? Uh, no, not actually. <laughs> we, we don't have any big challenges. <laughs> uh, and that's the reason we were established in 1996. So we have been growing steady, and um, it's uh, always been an uh, organization who could react rapidly to new circumstances and uh, we have been in a lucky position that we have our own system so when this uh, COVID-19 situation happened it was also very easy we were all digitalized we could work from home and uh, we could have a rapid growth without uh, having hiring new people so yeah so actually I can't say that we have had any big challenges Fantastic. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the 
question. Uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I mean, again, not sure this has been your uh, territory first the last years, but um, um, of course there are because uh, you want to take, I mean, my neighborhood. We suddenly we get two spots uh, for my parking place and my place, and fuel by it, to be living. And um, yeah, I think you, you have been looking at that place for uh, some time, uh, that we want to have car sharing cars in this place. Um, and now it happened this summer, and um, uh, you have to make sure that all it fits with all the regulations and uh, you can put up the correct signs. I mean, it's uh, interesting how much uh, the sign framework works in Norway. I mean, if there's no dispensation at all, more or less, if you want to just write just another add another word, hard, really hard to make. Uh, but at the same time, uh, taking away parking lots also means uh, that car, some cars have to go. And that's been a little issue in that, uh, that spot because um, I got this from my neighbors. Uh, that uh, this old man who lived there, um, he, um, he was afraid of driving now and he needed a car every day to go to the shop. And I could say, uh, you should just start rebuilding it. That's, uh, but it's a bit hard for an, uh, to tell this an elder person that you, should, you need a smartphone now and uh, it's already a computer, he didn't have it either. And um, you should, uh, yeah. And then um, he ended up having a car standing at the road, but he never uh, dared to use it because uh, if he drove and he were to come back again, that spot might be totally taken. Uh, and that are issues. Uh, so we meaning the car was just standing there and he didn't move in the apartment. Uh, we are trying to solve this issue now, right, of course. Uh, those are barriers we have to work with. I mean, uh, we are affecting people's lives and we have to figure out uh, we can do these changes as well as taking care of those who are have disability needs uh, and elderly and uh, that makes it complex of course yeah. Thank you. i have a question uh, is it okay yeah we, we, okay uh, maybe for about starting car sharing and there they had this overview of um, who uses car sharing now I don't, I don't know if the data was from vehicle here where we're living in um, well, perhaps this is Oslo I don't know. Uh, but they had this road uh, they said uh, most people are highly educated uh, 10 to 10 to the left uh, and um, between 30 and 50 I think and because of that uh, the municipalities they should place all their car sharing uh, vehicles where they find the, these kind of people. Mm -hmm. Because they are those who um, used to be um, car sharing. And that's in highly dense areas, in the city center, right? Um, and then they can ask, well, 
do they have car sharing uh, possibilities out in the suburbs? And in Russia, we will, show, we will start doing the mobility points now, right? Uh, but most likely, I guess all the data is to be, uh, that all the vehicles are in the city center, and then you get data that people who live in the city center are those who are highly educated. It's those who are tend to the left. I mean, uh, <laughs> the election, I mean, it was MD Gale was the largest party in uh, the city center, I think, last election. And then you get those people in your uh, numbers. So, uh, I was a bit uh, angry at uh, Menon <laughs> uh, for recommending them to just go in the dense areas. There might be other people, I mean, as Tui said, you need to find out those who don't need a car every day, and they can, you can find those everywhere uh, as long as they're uh, connected to the public transport. Uh, thank you very much, both uh, Tori and Lars. And I will uh, hand it back over to, oh, and, oh, question. Yeah, we, we get it. We Just get one it. moment. <laughs> Hand it over to Sid for the uh, end and questions. Take these over you. I don't need a microphone if that's what you're working on. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> we will get to it. Thank you. Um, I we we have ten minutes, and I wanted to hand back to Amber um, because we would like to take questions. We see there are lots of them, which is a good thing. So we will take these ten minutes to. Take questions and she'll moderate and have all the speakers up so you can pick a speaker if you want as long as answers are brief and uh, so on. And uh, Tori, you can stay with us as well. But I want to say one thing so that we make sure we don't miss out on it at the end. Um, a seminar like this takes some doing to put together and somebody, so this is kind of the round of thanks but we will take the questions after. Um, Amber has been really helpful in pulling this together. And uh, I want to mention Judith Dalsko, uh, who has been helping to video record it. Um, Eleanor Johnson and uh, Inge Christin uh, Yoseta who have been helping serve food while observing protocol and uh, making sure that the auditorium works and everything's in place. Um, and Christin Preussel-Gulbranson who is the energy director at uh, UEB who is with us today and who makes sure that we have the Bergen Energy Lab as a forum to have these kinds of seminars. There's also one coming up in October, I think yes. on the 7th on sustainable aviation which uh, is a very peculiar time to talk about the topic, but uh, we know that it has been a very challenging time for that sector also, so um, just a heads up on that. And uh, of course to all of the speakers and everybody who's here today for making the time, taking half a day, and uh, I won't say more because now I'm getting into the questions, but just to say thank you for coming. We will keep having work on this over the next year, so this is just a way of starting a conversation that has already been going on for many years, and we're really excited to continue it. But over to Amber. Uh, okay, so I think we have a question starting here. So we'll do a question and then uh, we'll figure out who's the best to respond. Try and keep the response under a minute because we are down to about eight minutes. So go ahead. Okay, thank you. I, I actually have two issues. And I, and I think one of the main challenges is that, uh, that we, or, and possibilities, is that there's a lot of capacity with a private car driving around with one person in, it, in, in each car. And so my question is, for that one, is that, is there any ways we could see that we could fill up these cars? Is there any, I mean, I, the technology should be available there. So actually, if you can connect the walking people with cars, with one person in, we could do that. Okay, it's, it's, it's the, taxi, the taxi people wouldn't like it, of course, but, but there, is, there, is there some forces to, 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 to see that as one of the solutions? And the other thing is that since I see many of the problems in the city center comes from people from outside Bergen coming into Bergen, uh, uh, and is there what about a network of boats in in these issues? Is that discussed in this? I can try to answer that. Is it on? Yes. yes. Um, I've been working for a long time on ride sharing. You know, making people more people go in. The technology is there, you can use an app, you can match people, no problem. But that's the private sphere or the private car is really hard to get, get into. <laughs> uh, it's, in, it's in our habits, that's, that's a very short conclusion of many years work on that uh, issue, I think. But I, in the future, I think everything, I mean, all the vehicles that we're talking about, the shared vehicles, the automated or not, they will be 
ride sharing will be the norm. Well, everything will be public transport, just or shared transport in different sizes and uh, ranges. That's the hope for the future. But until that, I think there's a little bit, we, we don't get very far because we're stuck in our habits. <laughs> um, uh, are there other questions? Um, Tori, do you have anything to add on that uh, last question? Did you hear it okay? Uh, I'm not sure. Uh, it had to do with um, the potential of uh, matching people up for uh, like filling up cars so they're not um, like single occupancy driving around. Yeah, and as uh, we said, there are already options and applications for that. So uh, I'm not sure if uh, the public are ready for it. Be a big, a big change, but uh, the technology and people are working on it. Yeah. So hopefully in the future it will be useful for some people. Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Tori, I'm I'm wondering how uh, do you decide where you put out new cars? Like, what what is the process behind that? Is it a conversation with the municipality, or is it more on the data that you have in the in the bill uh, Yeah, uh, we are not doing it in a scientific way, but uh, we are having data about demands. So uh, we are trying to to put the cars where we have got vendors. And um, some places we would like to have more cars if we had more parking spaces available. So we are not completely free, but um, yeah. And it's, uh, it's hard to say if we have to call for the right, right places because we are not we have sort of having data about the people are using the cars, but not where they are. Um, we have been picking up the cars. We had the cars available. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it's kind of a, um, a put because we we are members of, of of car sharing, and we moved from the city centre, and we moved out to Fillingstown, and and then and, and it's a huge difference in 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 what cars are available, and and we've had several occasions where we had to take a bus into the city to get a car. So I'm just wondering if yeah how if you ask also when members leave if they why they've left because I do know a lot of people in Fillingsdale that have left because the like they they just not there's no access to cars so if there's any sort of um, system to that of how yeah how you find out where to put out cars but I think you answered yeah. that yeah yeah no it's 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 a bit like uh, trying and failing. Hmm. Yeah. So, and also, as we are trying to have a kind of similar use on every car, but then we want to meet up in the district as well. So, we are kind of having some cars facing place where they are not so popular as a kind of reaching out to people. Yeah. Yeah. But it, it, it's a bit trying, frankly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a very good question, uh, and I believe the municipality can have a role. Yeah. When you talk about Felix Dahl, you talk about Wals, and you talk about Spelhaven, uh, or maybe West Compton, where there are large uh, municipality you know, uh, yeah, units that are placed there that have uh, their least uh, service cars now that could use to replace some of that use with car sharing. So if we get car sharing for the municipality and reserve spaces uh, based on that need, that opens up a lot more for people to live there as well. So that, well, that way we can be a facilitator. Uh, any final questions? Well, I mean, I think it's one minute to 3.30, so shall we? Shall we call it a day? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for being here. And uh, yeah. anything else to say?